What is up, everybody? This is your guy, Kalai, and welcome back to Budget Buys. And today, I'm going to be talking about the Mojo 84 from Melgeek. I originally wanted to get this up about a week or so ago, but technical issues and health issues kind of derailed those plans. Though, that being said, I am kind of glad the technical issues happened because that allowed me to work with Melgeek to hammer out one final bug before this thing starts shipping out. And we were able to do that while I was recuperating, so it all kind of works out. Also, before I go any further in this video, I do need to say that this keyboard was provided free of charge by Melgeek for this video, though they didn't pay me to say anything in particular about it. I mean, if they had, would I have even mentioned the fact that there were technical difficulties? I don't think so. With that disclaimer out of the way, let's go ahead and take this out of the box. Inside the box, you receive the keyboard itself, the manual, a quick start guide, a USB 2.0 cable with a Type-C connector, a 2.4 GHz USB dongle, as well as a keycap puller. And here we have the Mojo 84 in all of its transparent shell glory. And I've got to admit, I have a bit of a weakness for tech with transparent shells. As illustrated by my GBA from back in the day, as well as this Game Boy Color that I thrifted a while back for, I want to say, less than 10 bucks. And I say less than 10 bucks because I've been so spoiled by low price tech at thrift stores that I probably wouldn't have paid more than that. Like I said, I have a weakness for this translucent aesthetic. And this actually taps into another weakness of mine, and that's the minimalist design with blatant statements of what you're getting on the device itself. I mean, the spacebar says, this is plastic. On the back, you can see the dimensions listed on the keyboard, as well as the copyright year. And last but not least, on the part facing away from you on the keyboard, it once again talks about how it is plastic, as well as the collaboration that went into making this. What can I say? I'm one of those weirdos that kind of geeks out whenever I see a product on the shelf that has just bare bones white packaging and black text telling you what it is. I think this obsession comes from some of the movies I've watched in the past where it was so low budget they really couldn't afford to feature brands in their films, nor did they want to pay a prop house for any of their fake products, so instead you have just white boxes that say cereal or white cans that say cola. It's just, it hits the right spot for me. That little bit of geeking out out of the way, let's actually dig into the features of this keyboard and not just the aesthetics. First off is the keycap profile. These are MDA keycaps, which are a bit more rounded than the OEM profile keycaps that come with most keyboards, though they're nowhere near as rounded as XDA keycaps, and they do keep the differential height seen in OEM keycaps as opposed to XDA. They're kind of like a hybrid between XDA and OEM. Now, it's not just the profile of these keycaps that's a little bit special, because not only are these MDA keycaps, but these are opaque double-shot ABS keycaps, which, as far as I can tell, are the new hotness, since this is the third set of premium keycaps I've gotten my hands on that use this production method. Though, most likely, this is only going to be the second set of these you've seen featured on my channel. The others should be in a video later on this month. Previously, if you wanted a keycap like this, what you would need to do is go with one like this, which is made with sublimated PBT, which in and of itself is fine, due to the fact that the image will be relatively permanent, though arguably nowhere near as permanent as double shot ABS. And the difference between these two production methods comes down to the fact that while the double shot ABS is actually made with two different pieces of plastic, one for the outer shell and one on the inside, which is going to take the shape of whatever legend you want on the keycap. Sublimated PBT is actually a printing method, so you start off with a blank white keycap 
and then transfer the image to the keycap using specialized dye ink and heat. This is going to cause the ink to convert to a gas, aka sublimate, and leach into the keycap. The end result is a design that won't wear off as easily as a surface print due to the fact that it is embedded a fraction of a millimeter into the actual substrate. But if you get a scratch deep enough, you're going to see the white surface underneath. Not so much here. Also, until recently, double shot ABS was really only used like this, where you have your opaque keycap with a translucent inner legend which allows the LEDs to shine through. That's not going to be happening with these caps. Of course, a lot of premium keyboards actually have been moving away from RGB keycaps, so it kind of works out. Another point in favor of these opaque double shot keycaps is the fact that they're actually about as thick as the PBT keycaps and as such have a very similar sound profile. So if I bring my caliper in, and take the standard double shot ABS keycap. If I just take a little bit of a pinch right here, you can see at around this point, it's only 0.78 millimeters. And that's due to the fact that as you can hopefully see here, the double shot portion of the keycap does not come all the way down. This seems to be the standard when it comes to these translucent double shots. However, on the PBT keycap, since it's one solid piece all the way through, it's 1.55, 1.6, somewhere in that area, millimeters thick. And the double shot ABS, which also goes all the way down, is 1.36 millimeters. So it's within a reasonable margin of error to the PBT. And that will affect the sound. You'll see it later in the sound test portion of this video. Now that I've gone ridiculously in depth on the caps, it's time to talk about what lies beneath, specifically the switches, because these are something a little special. Just go ahead and get that out of there and let's change camera angles really quickly. What we have here is a set of kale box switches that are a little special. As you can see, Melgeek commissioned them to make this in the plastic color scheme. And these are not only linear box switches, but unlike these box jades that I have, the plastic switches are actually five pin. Not gonna lie, I only discovered that after starting this video, but I think it's kind of cool. Though outside of that difference, these do still have the same box switch style setup in the back here where all of the components inside the switch are enclosed. This is going to make things a bit quieter. Of course, the plastic switches are linear. Specifically, these fall in between the standard linear that I'm used to, which has an actuation force of around 40 grams, and Featherlight linear switches that have an actuation force of around 35 grams. These have 38. These also have a slightly shorter travel than your standard switches, coming in at around 1.8 millimeters versus 2 millimeters, and a total travel of 3.6 millimeters as opposed to 4 millimeters. And while to most people that's not going to sound significant, shaving off your initial travel by about 10% makes more of a difference than you'd think, and it's going to feel a bit different with that shorter overall travel. That's actually kind of why I really dig low profile switches. Now that we have the caps and switches out of the way, it's time to go deeper. And by that, I mean I'm only going to show you things superficially because I am not taking this keyboard apart, despite the fact that I kind of really want to. I have a bad track record of disassembling clear tech and then applying a little bit too much torque to the screws when putting back together and causing spider webbing. This is a very nice keyboard and I don't want to do that. Fortunately, a lot of the stuff we have going on here, I can show you from this angle. And to start that off, we have the base plate, which is made of polycarbonate, because as it said on the box, this is plastic. However, the polycarbonate is actually pretty dang sturdy and doesn't leave you with the hollow sound that you would get out of most plastic base plates. It really does sound on par to a metal base plate, and you'll be able to hear that later on during the typing test. 
Next is something that I actually can't show you from this angle, so let's switch things up. Underneath the base plate, there's a pour on mute pad that's meant to fill the gap between the base plate and the PCB. But it gets better, because underneath the pour on mute pad is a pour on switch mat. It's a mat that actually sits between the switch and the PCB. It's meant to eliminate a bit of the sound and rattle that you're going to be getting. Now, as for the PCB, not only do we have a five pin compatible PCB with Kale style sockets, but it also has south facing LEDs. Also on the PCB are a couple of sayings, those being need a keyboard, not friends, and have a good typing day. That's a nice little touch that you can only see with a transparent outer shell. And the final layer of this cake has to be the silicone mute pad underneath the PCB. And I can't really show it from this camera angle, but if I swap to another, you can see that this thing is thick, making full contact to both the PCB and the bottom of the shell, even on the portion that is angled upwards. Though, at the same time, it's not that thick due to the fact that it is not a solid block, but instead it has multiple chambers in it. Of course, those chambers are gonna do an excellent job muting the sound from the switches. And to drive that point home, here's the sound test. Now the last physical feature we need to talk about on this keyboard is the switch on the back here, right next to the USB port. Because if you take this switch and push it to the left, you're going to activate the 2.4 gigahertz mode, as shown by the green LED here. However, if you switch it to the right, you're going to end up in Bluetooth mode, as indicated by the blue LED. The way to set this keyboard up over Bluetooth is actually very simple. First thing you're gonna to need to do is make sure your keyboard is in Bluetooth mode and then turn on Bluetooth for the device you wanna connect it to. Next, hold down the Bluetooth key and hit one of the numbers one through eight in order to enter discovery mode. Next, hit pair new device or whatever the equivalent is on whatever you're trying to pair the keyboard to and you should see something along the lines of melgeek-c, whichever device slot you're trying to pair to. And of course, if you want the keyboard to forget the device, instead of doing a short press of the Bluetooth plus number combination, do a long press. You'll know you're successful when the blue LED flashes red. Now let's talk about KB Tools. This is the software from Melgeek that is made to work with all of their different keyboards and was actually the source of the technical difficulties that I mentioned at the start of this video. And like I said then, I'm actually glad that happened because there is a non-zero chance that it might end up happening to someone else. Like I said, we have a fix. But before I get to that, let's start things off with the key tab in KB Tools. Here you're able to rebind any key on the keyboard to another single key press. And to do that, first make sure you're on the correct function layer with zero being the default, click the key you want to rebind, then go down to the selector panel and click whichever key you want to change it to. You can do this for not only layer zero, which as I said is the default, but also function one, two, and three. And that's actually why I didn't do a breakdown of the function layer earlier on in the video. Also, keep in mind, if you do want to have something on the third function layer, you will need to bind FN3 to a key on the keyboard. Next up, we have the LED settings. And here's where things get kind of interesting, because Whereas most keyboards are going to have all of the color settings and LED modes built into the keyboard directly, here you have eight slots that you can change to whatever you want, and then save to the keyboard. In the case of the colors, you can select from any of the ones you see here, as well as double clicking on a color in order to customize it using either the RGB sliders, the palette, or even the HTML values. And as for the LED modes themselves, there are 30 two to choose from, which is a heck of a lot more than the 18 or so average. Even better, the fact that Melgeek limits you to eight slots is kind of a blessing in disguise. 
because personally, I only ever use one or two LED modes on a keyboard, and they're usually separated by 10 or more. So if I want to change things up, I'm going to have to hold down function and hit the LED change mode 10 friggin' times. Whereas I can take my eight favorites from the 32 that I can select from and cram those into the keyboard instead. Even better, you have per key customization on each of these profiles. So you could go with everything set to mode one, mode two, so on and so forth, or you could have some keys set to mode one, some keys set to mode two, some keys set to mode three, all on the same profile. This allows you to get creative with it. That being said, for the LED demo portion of this video, I'm only going to be showing you the eight default modes. And speaking of per key customization, you can also do that with the color settings. Next up, we have the shortcut tab, which is pretty simple. It allows you to create new shortcuts for your keyboard. In order to make a new shortcut, first you're going to need to click add. That's going to create a new shortcut on the side that has a single box in it for now. Next, select a key on the keyboard above, then click the box in the newly created shortcut in order to bind it. Next, click the plus sign in order to add a new box to the shortcut and repeat the previous steps. From here, you can add even more keys to your shortcut, or if you're satisfied with how things are set up, you can instead assign a function and parameter to your shortcut. And of course, if you want to get rid of a shortcut, just click the checkbox next to it and then click the garbage can to delete it. Also, don't forget to download any new shortcuts to the keyboard. Next up, we have the macro page, and this is where the little tech hiccup happened. Because when I first opened KB Tools with this keyboard plugged in, the macro list was empty. And the problem was that the sample keyboard that I was sent had shipped from the factory with the wrong firmware, one that didn't support all of the features with KB Tools. Fortunately, Melgeek hooked me up with the correct firmware, and as you can see, everything is working. If you have that issue as well, definitely check the Melgeek website because they have firmware updates for all of their keyboards available on the downloads page. And by the time the Mojo 84 ships out, there should be one on there for it as well. If that's still not the case by the time you get your keyboard and you do have this issue, just reach out to them. They should be able to get you sorted pretty quickly. Now, as for how you make a macro, first select one of the eight available macro slots, then click record, hit your keys and click stop. After you've done that, you're able to customize your macro. You can add or remove key presses, you can change the delay between the key presses, and you can even delete the macro and start fresh. And for those of you who are worried about the fact that I said there are only eight macro slots available, don't worry. You are able to import and export macros, so technically you can have any number of macros saved to your computer, you're just limited to eight at a time on the keyboard. Once you have your macro, you are going to need to bind it to something in order to use it, and you can either set it as a shortcut or go over to the keys tab, select a function layer that you want to have your shortcut on, select a key, and then click the appropriate macro slot down in the selector below. Next up, we have the settings tab, which is where you're able to adjust the polling rate of the keyboard, the sleep timer, and of course, update the firmware. Last but not least, we have the little green menu box, which is right next to the minimize and close buttons. And here you're able to do things like change the language and even reset the keyboard to factory defaults. All right, that pretty much covers everything with the Melgeek Mojo 84. And as for what I think, I'm not gonna lie. I kinda love it. I absolutely adore the way this feels and sounds with typing. I'm always on the search for a keyboard that is a lot quieter than what a lot of other people are looking for. And this definitely fits the bill with all of its layers of sound baffling. Add to that the thick keycaps and the very well-made custom kale box switches, and you got something special here. Now, as for whether this is worth the asking price, that's down to you. And you know what? Let's actually touch on the price point for a second. Because if you're watching this video while the Kickstarter project is still live, then you should be able to get this keyboard at a discount. 
Now, sadly, the very early bird pricing of $159 sold out pretty much immediately, but last time I checked, there were still a few slots for the early bird special, which is $179. If that one is also sold out, you can still pick this up at the Kickstarter discounted price of $199. And if you're watching this post-Kickstarter campaign, the final retail price is going to be $229. And yes, I know this is very pricey when compared to a lot of the other stuff I cover, which comes in at around 10 bucks. But even at the $229 price point, I do know where they're coming from. Because not only do we have a premium style shell and matching keycap set, but there's also the custom kale box switches that even without the customization go for a bit of a premium. Then there's the pour on mute pad, the pour on switch mat, and this super chonky mute pad underneath. And that's just the hardware side. On the software side, you have a lot of features that you're not going to be seeing in a keyboard below the triple digit point. Most specifically, the fact that you can customize the function layer. Nine times out of 10, the function layer is gonna be hard coded into the keyboard. Now. If this overview has gotten your attention and you do want to get your hands on one of these keyboards, I'm going to include links to both the Kickstarter project as well as to the official MelGeek website and Discord server down in the description below. And no, these are not affiliate links. I don't get paid for any purchases made through those. Now, I feel like this video has dragged on way longer than I originally intended. And while I normally say that as a bit of a joke, in this case, I am dead serious because I have spent more than double my usual amount of time recording this video. So until next time, this is your guy, Cly, signing off.